This is the New Year's Eve. This, it's like the Just Shoot It Christmas party, right? We've got uh, three of our favorite filmmakers back on the pod. It's an annual tradition at this point. We've got Carl and Roxy and Tim. Welcome back, everybody. Glad to be back. Thank you. We've been doing this for years, but you three we've had on for a long while. And it was kind of nice because we could have rode the pandemic out with you three. Oh, totally. Yeah. So every year it was like, okay, well, what, what? What do we think is going to be the next year? But it, it kicked off with our 2019 New Year's Eve, and it was like, oh, yeah, we're all we're all starry eyed. Oh my god, we were so positive. I remember I predicted a global pandemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Orton was like, guys, it's going to be yeah. rough. Wait, we're in senior prom. This is senior prom. It's more like a senior senior winter formal kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Carlin, will you be my date? <laughs> Baby, uh, you've already been asked by me. <laughs> yeah. Check your mail. Check your mailbox. We're, we're going to dig into our goals, our journeys, all of that. But Roxy, it sounds like we don't really know what you, what your journey has been for this year. I haven't seen you a ton. So tell us about your year, Roxy. I haven't seen you in a very long time. And I sort of fell off social media this year. And I've been relatively quiet. And that's been very new for me because... And Lo and Orin, you know, when you first interviewed me, I was all about hashtag Super Director Roxy. I've taken a complete identity shift this year because a Lifetime movie I directed got a Critics' Choice nomination this year, right? Yeah, it was really cool. It was bizarre, right? It was like made for 500K. I was for hire on it. It got nominated and then it got like Hollywood Critics Association nomination. Like it was bizarre. And just for listeners maybe who aren't tracking Roxy's career as closely as they should, this is kind of a, a pivot in terms of like your t- your genre, basically, right? Like oh, you've yes. been doing kind of like thrillers and horror, like like more dark, yeah. stylized sort of work. And this was the first thing that was like a pure drama, basically. Before I always chased money mm-hmm. and Ooh. I've always chased opportunity and I've always said yes to everything which this was my awakening moment was at the awards gala and I just felt like the biggest fraud Mm. like I just felt like so completely like standing next to squid game and standing next to the cast of pose was really cool but also (laughs) you know I just felt like it was this really strange feeling of like yeah, you got here through this like job that you did and it was really cool. But if this is where you go, imagine how the world would respond if you just showed up as yourself. And I thought that I've never really invested in my own stories or felt like anyone would care or think that I'm good enough. And then so after that, you know, I went back some of the companies that worked on the movie came back to me. They're like, hey, Roxy, like, you know, we loved that, you know, great job with the movie. And it was all really, really good. But then I kept getting the same offers for the same rates, hmm. you know, stories I don't really get excited about. It was more so so I can make rent. And then I just thought, you know, this is where everything needs to change. And I, um, I just made a commitment to myself and I said for the next six months, if it's not above three million dollars has like an indie budget, you know, if it's unless it really speaks to me, like I, I'm i not going to say yes to it. Right. And that's really hard because you just don't know when that next thing is coming. I basically told a lot of the producers that I used to work with, I said, you know, thank you so much for everything, all the opportunities you've given me. But this is my new ask. Like if there's something like this that you want to think, but but everything below that, I'm going to have to say no to. I think I really understand what my worth was at this point because it's, you know, I felt like I've toiled endlessly and I've worked really hard and I, I feel like I deserve what I have. Now I, I just, there's something within me that's like something really needs to shift. You were doing like TV, like on an Eli Roth show. Like how, how does that play into? That was last year. Like- and, um, and then And I didn't hear from them. They got renewed for a second season and I didn't hear from them. And that stressed me out because it made me question if I did well enough. They seemed like they responded well, but why didn't they call me back for season two? Right. Mm. So that was also something that I was struggling with. And then so for the next like four months, it was terrible because I just didn't have any work and I just did tarot readings and 
I worked on my first, I co-wrote my first feature, which was really exciting and totally worth all of that. But I had to like be very vocal with my friends who wanted to hang out and like ask my parents for help on rent. Like I'm being, I'm airing out all my dirty laundry, you guys, you know what I'm saying? Like sure, um, sure. I got by, but it's like, if I needed help, I was like, look, it's, if you're willing to help me, like I would appreciate it. But if not, like I'm happy, that's okay too. Like I'll go work at a coffee shop. Like I just feel like something needs to change. Like something has to change or else I'm just doing the same stuff and I'm not growing. And then one day in June, mm -hmm. like on a Monday, the Eli Roth show contacted me again and they're like, Hey Roxy, we loved you so much last year. Like, can you come back and direct two more, two more episodes for season two? And they're like, and not only that, can you kick off block one? So they asked me to do episodes one and two. And then all of my assumptions about, mm. oh, it needs to premiere during Spooktober or whatever. That was out the window because I was making about assumptions about something that wasn't even true. And so I'm like, cool, great. Like, it's like a higher rate. Sure. And it's like you all get offered something. You're that's saying like, you got in your head about. I got in my head. About yeah. Things you, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Even crazier, you guys, is that yeah. the next day. Literally the next day I got an offer for like the biggest movie I've ever gotten. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, And it's like, and the, the rate is like five times more than I've ever gotten, you know? And it's like, awesome. and it's a, it's a, it's a story I'm really excited about. And these two things happen two days in a row. Oh my God. That's amazing. You know? And it's like within like all, like there were moments of doubt, like in those five months, I even asked like my friends, like, hey, like, should I go back to producing? Like, are there producing managing jobs? Like, and then my friend would be like, yeah, here, here's a eight days for like 12K. And I'm like, oh, that sounds nice. Right. But then there's something in me that's like, no, like, you have to say no to this. Right. It's sort of like a test before you get your reward. And mm -hmm. um, the universe works in really strange ways, which is why I think it's so bizarre. Like, all of this happened like in a row. But then, I said I wanted to do commercials and then I did this Peloton campaign and then like I did my first label music video. Like all of this happened within two months after waiting it out with nothing for like four months, you mm -hmm. know? So now I'm like pitching for movies that like are like at a completely different level because I made that shift. But um, y'all look at a new Roxy, babes. All right. Like. <laughs> isolate oh. all the time now you know and i just like know my worth now and it's like so amazing because i think we're always asking ourselves like how do we best promote ourselves how do we become more visible but sometimes at a certain point i think it's just about withdrawing mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um which is the hardest thing to do anyways that's the nutshell of what happened this year and i'm very excited to kick off next year because like this this new energy has served me but it was the hardest thing to do to start saying no especially that guilt where it's like these are past relationships that I've had for years but mm. it's like in order to make that leap I felt like I had to say goodbye to certain things for mm -hmm. good but hopefully y'all resonated with that in some way as well oh man well, that's I, beautiful I, yeah no I, and I think it's something where when you first decide to become a full-time director you take mm -hmm. that leap and you kind of think that that's maybe the last time you have to set those boundaries you know what i mean like you mm -hmm. have to say like well i'm not taking editing anymore or whatever your survival job was up until that point and you think like okay i did it and i, I i'm letting the world know that this is what i do now but it's it's a reminder that like in order to level up, sometimes you have to jettison some of the different things that take up your time and space and energy. I, I have a hard time enjoying the downtime mm -hmm. and not just like, like the difference between me worrying for the four months that you were done, that you weren't working versus just like having a nice time and like walking in the park for four months. There's nothing that I'm doing differently, except for like in one version, I'm happy and in one version, I'm, you know, uh, grinding my teeth down to nubs. Carlin, Tim, Oren, how do you deal with those fallow periods 
do you trust the universe the way Roxy threw herself into the wind? You know, how do you how do you do that? Right. Because that's part of it. Right. And we all did it on the day. We all did it one time. (laughs) Yeah. Fair. Do you know what I mean? It's a great use of fallow. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. I have a, a similar, you know, at least a part of Roxy's story I, I can relate to and and happened with this year, which is coming out of the pandemic earlier this year, I wasn't really feeling the production company I was with for commercials and, and music videos. And I had been feeling like the new assignment is learning to say no. So, you know, with a little bit of thought and a lot of trepidation, I basically like left that company and So it's for the first time, like in like, I guess, eight, nine years, I'm not repped and still I'm not Mm -hmm. repped for, uh, for those kinds of things. Well, I'm repped, but by a bunch of people, non-exclusively, like as opposed to how that was. And, you know, it was kind of a weird shift that I felt like I was, you know, the the reason that what I was saying no to was I, I just wasn't really connecting with the work that was being sent my way. And there were some other issues with that company. And I felt like it was, it was sort of like, uh, Usually I like to know where I'm going to go next, but I just felt like, well, I don't know that, but I need to make a change, open up the space for other things to happen. And actually lots of cool projects did come and lots of other companies too. So it's been really a fortunate move for me, for sure. Um, I'm excited. And, and for, just for, for context, you're saying you were, ex- had been exclusively rostered at different companies for, for years. I had been, basically. yeah, the whole time, yeah. Now you're no longer exclusive at any commercial or music video production company. Exactly. I mean, I still have people repping me and produ- sure. production companies. You're getting like bored, but it's not. It's yeah. not the same. You're not on a single website, basically. It's true, and yeah, exactly. Yeah. Are you happier? Um, I am happier. I was immediately happier uh, because I was feeling like like i like i was about to say coming out of the pandemic i just didn't really feel like i wanted to rebuild with this company you know and sort of like pick up steam the work they were sending i didn't connect with i thought it was going to lead me away from you know sort of the direction i want to go in that world and and so what i did is is actually of course it meant months of not really working enough and you know going into tailspins and all and walks in the park that well i was gritting my teeth but like but what I did do was uh, fall into some heavy writing and have co-written two different pilots and have pitches ready. So, like, I definitely don't feel bad about the time that I, like, for mm-hmm. once didn't, like, royally screw up. And actually, like, I really kind of, I was pretty disciplined and, and wrote a lot, basically, more than I ever have in my life, you know. That's awesome, Tim. Yeah, I'm excited. And so now one of those is with, I, both of them are actually like out with people. And so we'll see. Well, that's a perfect pitch over to Deep Work, Carlin. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Deep Work, Carlin. Um, wow. I, I'll lay my cards out on the table too. And uh, this year has been hard. It's been a really, it's been a really hard year. I am. Um, in fact, I'm sure I've talked about it on the show, but like I got so close to doing two features at the two big streamers and both of them fell apart um and it was brutal oh, you know it was like it was so brutal <laughs> and like mm-hmm. yeah people but one was a netflix one was a hulu and um you know it's not as if those scripts and those projects are like dead per se but um i don't know what's going to happen to them and i don't know if they will be set up anywhere else so, yeah, so this summer was just really hard because I've never been rejected. And then I, and then I, and Orin and Matt know this, and then I, after those two things fell apart, I then also in that same like two month period lost six commercials in a row. And I've, that's oh, never wow. happened to me. <laughs> and so, so this cool. year has been a really, yeah. And like, and like, look, I've made a lot of money this year. Like, that's cool. Like, I, that's great. And that's fulfilling to some degree. But not really, because I like I want to make a movie, and that's what I thought I was going to be doing this year. Mm-hmm. And so I feel a little bit like I feel like a little creatively lost at this point because I'm mm. like I thought I had my two big narrative things going, and now those aren't happening. So now I don't really know what to do next. So I'm like trying to give myself the space to figure that out. And of course, I'm like I have other irons in the fire, 
but um but yeah so the the panic the question about your like panic thing um at after may i did this like big nike series and this was before all this stuff happened i like took a, a few weeks off and i i was fucking crushing my time off you know what i mean i was like ooh, just naturally creative writing right. down ideas <laughs> you know just <laughs> going to palm springs for a week and then all this shit happened and when you don't choose to have time off but it's chosen for you because no one will hire you that is the difference you know yeah. <laughs> it's like oh, yeah. when i could when i could choose it for myself i was really like wow this is so necessary blah 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 mm. but but mm-hmm. yeah um so it really depends on the day. I think probably for all of us, like the days you wake up and you're like, thank God I have time to write instead of just selling fucking cereal or whatever. You know, so true. Mm-hmm. You know what's funny, uh, Car- Carlin, you make me think of, I used to feel like, oh, it was a good writing day if I, I hit that moment of flow, you know, mm-hmm. that kind of like effortless ideas are coming and you feel great. And now... I've had a pretty hard 180 where I feel the most accomplished when I get pages written and also it, it really hurt and I hated it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> like I just like trudged my way through it and it's just yes. like kind of miserable. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I'd prefer flow, but like, you know, at least you're doing it. And that to me is what sometimes is the accomplishment, you know, your discipline. Until November of this year, I'd say this 2022 has been like the worst in the, over the past five or six years, my worst year. Oh my God. Uh, like as a director, like career wise, I just, I did not have a ton of jobs. I didn't feel like super fulfilled. Um, and there was, it was a really slow summer for me. And I, I kind of feel like for us, like that time you had off that no one was calling you Roxy. I, I spoke to, you know, we speak to a lot of directors. You weren't, I know you made an active choice to turn down kind of these um, smaller jobs, but I think everyone I know was had had like a really slow summer. Like the LA Times wrote about how there's like 30% less production in LA this summer compared to last summer, Mm -hmm. both in TV and commercials and everything, you know, just um, film permit pulling was like way down. I feel like in every phase of my career, I have to relearn how to say no. Mm -hmm. And because Mm -hmm. at every phase, at every level, we... We, we kind of master that level and then we realize that we're better than, you know, we get every job we're up for and then we start saying no and then we get super depressed and the anxiety, Matt, that you're describing, I don't think there's like a freelancer in the world that doesn't have that sure. anxiety between jobs. Um, and then you get the better job and then you <laughs> get to pitch on a few more better jobs and then you start losing, you know, commercial after commercial, feature after feature. You're up against your heroes, but mm-hmm. they're like, you would hire them instead of you, you know, like yeah, the yeah, imposter well, syndrome happens yeah. at every level. And yeah, at the end of last year, I said no to a big job. And then like six months later, I was like, I, I'm an idiot <laughs> for saying no to that, you know, hmm. um, it paid so much. And well, I, I mean, the, the problem also is like hindsight. You're like, well, I could have spent 12 days shooting that thing and it would have been great. Like, and mm-hmm. then I would have right. had, but it wouldn't the, have been great it would have it wouldn't have been paid. great it would have been three months you know yeah but it, and it would have paid and you know i literally today i was like i, I gotta just sit down one of my days off and audit my mm. like thousand subscriptions i have to peacock and netflix and mm-hmm. youtube premium all this like because Don't at some point peacock roku or mm-hmm. Tubi, uh which is where you can see see you next christmas this yeah, christmas next- season <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, two of those are free brilliantly <laughs> dropped in. but like at some point we have to make money, you know, it's not just about making rent, it's about paying for schools and all the other things. Do you um, think it's, um, do you think it's a mindset shift? You know, I've been listening to a lot of like money making podcasts because, mm-hmm. um, I just think I just don't want to struggle like this forever. And I don't think any of us want to, like every time we reach a certain goal, we set a new goal post for ourselves. So you may think, Oh yeah. Like, this is my new normal. And now I just want to make more money. I want to do bigger things. And we continue to strive for something and being unhappy about it without recognizing our progress. So, I mean, yes, I I think, especially with those of you who have families, there's like more, you know, there's a need to really create that. But, but, But do you guys think that though? Like, like, how do we break out of this cycle mentally? Because it's always going to happen. 
Wait, That's but why the is thing. that? A, you think it's a bad thing to set new goalposts once you've achieved your goal? I'm just, I'm just asking how to maintain our mental health because, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. because, because then we have anxiety and we're not being present and we're always wondering about what the future is going to hold and if we said yes or no to the wrong thing. When the next thing is coming and when we feel good, we're like, this just set me up forever, but it never mm-hmm. really does. Like totally. we're always in a state of uncertainty. So how do we? shift that so that we don't feel like we're completely uh, like it's not within our control at all times is what I'm saying. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, I, I, I think about, you know, the amount of money that inflation aside, like that, I think probably all of us are making relative to what we were living on when we first started out is a pretty extreme difference, right? as your quality of life expands and you start families or you go on vacations or whatever it is, Mm -hmm. we have to decouple our own happiness from whether or not we're working. Right. That's Mm. kind of the the thing that we're secretly saying. But it is for almost all of us. Right. Like, Oh, like, am I happy because I have a job or because I have five days off because I am coasting off the high of having just worked like that Mm -hmm. can't be. We can't. It it, it it is. But I I think my perspective on it is like, look, there's five of us. We've all been directing for at at least 10 years, right? That's what Mm -hmm. we do for our jobs. That's if someone asks you what you do, you say, I'm a director, a writer, director, right? Like whether we're bummed about not having work or like excited about the next job, we're all working. from not having work and like, oh, I don't know what to do with myself and I can't creatively interface with the world. Uh, those are that like I guess I, that's an understatement to say we're bummed, mm-hmm. right? Right, but but I'm saying look <laughs> at us. Like, sure, we all we go through big mood swings, um, but we we're all we're all persevering. I think what it is is like trying to unlearn this like hustle mentality that we've been brought up sure. in our generation, and like <laughs> I've been learning about like not compartmentalizing my life. Like again, I was I was listening to this podcast. This person was talking about like when you're visualizing your future, like that it's not driven by career, that it's mm-hmm. driven by the quality of life you want to have. And I thought that was really interesting because our whole lives growing up, people were like, what do you want to be? What do you want to be? Like ever since we were like, mm-hmm. you know, elementary school students, like an astronaut, I don't fucking know. Mm-hmm. You know, like no one fucking knows. But like, can you see yourself like like for me nowadays? I want to intentionally make breakfast. I need to exercise every day. I don't want to be rushed. I don't, you know, like I want to be able to go to a shop and buy something without freaking out about it. Like Mm -hmm. that's the life I want to live. And I think mission wise, like what you were talking about earlier, Enlo, I think filmmaking is a natural part of my strength and my life and the way I show up in the world. So I think, yeah, as a directing cool, as a director cool, but it's like in other ways as well, I'm not opposed to it. But nowadays I've been reframing the way I think about my future because mm-hmm. it's not about the Oscar. It's not about, you know, it's not about that for any of us. We just want to love what we do and be happy doing it. Before we started recording, I, I kind of like was like, hey, everyone, let's talk about our mission in addition to our goals. Um, and maybe intrinsic in that question is the embedded idea that like we are filmmakers as people and that roxy i think your point is that we're maybe more than just that and i have a hard time um wrapping like i don't my, my i don't want that, that to just to just be my identity you know mm-hmm. like i want to be maybe super I roxy i just want to be do. super <laughs> roxy take the director out of the center i just want to be super roxy respect uh, Gang, what, what do you think? Are you tacking on Super Director Tim? Super or Director? Is it, or is it just Let Super me Tim? Instagram really quick. Is it just Super Tim? Right? That's what oh, we're I asking. See. Yeah, okay. Sure. I mean... I mean, Tim's also a musician. That's true. A that's true. I've been playing in a band. I sort of accidentally fell into a band this year. Really? Yeah, it's been great. It's been so cool. But anyway, that has been, I will just say, that's been such a nice thing to have, the suddenly, like, going into a creative space that's not the, the usual. And um, with mm-hmm. people who are nice, by the way, and, like, just so open and free, like, artist, artistically. And because I'm not always, like, the most, like, okay, I'm, I'm free, but I'm also kind of, like, an overthinker, like, triangu- triangulator mm-hmm. person. 
which is Mm -hmm. why it makes it sometimes it makes it seem like I must spend eight months writing a script or something like, you know, we all spend years writing these things this year on these two projects that I co-wrote. I was not writing with my usual sort of partners who are much more established as writers than I am. I was writing with people who do not build themselves as writers at all. And they would just come with pages, like literally the next day they'd come back and I'd be like, okay, so we should like, the, we'd, we'd have a big brainstorm. And then, at, you know, the next morning I'd be like, okay, we should get together again and sort of talk about how we're going to attack that. And then, but the, but at the same time, they'd be sending me an email, which was 10 pages. Are you saying they're just, they're free? They're just, it's unencumbered. Is that it? I mean, that's definitely a, a nice way to make what I'm talking about connect with what we were just talking about. I'm not sure it really does, but I've, it's seven years of podcasting, Tim. It's, you a, know. it's a talent. It's a dark talent. I mean, basically, they're they were just yeah unencumbered, probably in a way that I might be. And yeah, anyway, circling back, playing music has also been great in that way. It's sort of just like you know, it just sort of moves things around in your head, uses the muscles. You're playing music; it sounds good. Mm we'll make a meal and eat and then play music. I mean, come on, it's just fun. And that we're going to play out at some point. But um, yeah, I, I think like if we're talking about like identity, you know, the director, super director, I think, you know, that's, that is the struggle. I mean, you're just identifying the struggle, which is life as a director, as a filmmaker, storyteller is always so unpredictable. It's just absolutely ridiculous. And then you can be on top of the world, have two made, big projects set up and they can just dissolve. You can have, you know, and then throw in a pandemic. It's just even crazier. But that, that's the thing is, is like, you know, there's all this anxiety that one carries with them day in and day out about this thing that we can't control. But then there's also, there's these things that we can control. Right. And I, I don't know. I, at some point somebody filled me on the idea that, you know, recognizing the anxiety of, of the, our kind of work isn't going away necessarily right away. You're not going to necessarily ever going to go away. You just have to kind of learn to go, okay, here's the anxiety. It's right here. It's going to be here. It doesn't mean that I have to necessarily engage it all of the time because that is such a creative creativity killer, you know, yeah. all the, the pain of like or the depression of a project going away. The, the six things you wrote, you know, treatments that didn't go your way. It's like, that those feel like punches in the face and it's just hard to necessarily, yeah, you can get back up, but are you going to get back up and write your screenplay at the coffee shop? I mean, but I think, you know, if you can learn for me, it, it, is, a, it is a detachment, like learning that the sort of the, the whatever's coming in my inbox this morning is not actually going to dictate like my practice of what I'm already doing. And, and like what Rossi's saying, like what I'm in for now, like, you know, what's the goal with, it's something different than what I've been doing in the past, something more meaningful to me. But also every morning, you know, three hours before I read emails, writing or whatever it is, you know, anyway. It's, it's complicated, the identity when you're making a living doing what we do, because I, there is a way where you can separate your mission as a storyteller, I think, separate from how you make money. But when you do, when those two are combined, it it does complicate things. But if you, we can remind ourselves that the mission isn't actually tied to financial or success or like how other people perceive us to be successful, mm-hmm. then that is that is useful. L- l- let me counter that, Carlin. Yeah, I'm curious. The, I've always thought that the <laughs> difference between as a person who does both features and commercials. I've always compartmentalized all, I put my all into a commercial. I love doing commercials, but I'm applying my artistry. It's not my art. Mm. Whereas a feature is my art. However, it's still encumbered by many, if not all of the same trappings. I've just talked myself out of it. Do you know what I mean? You still have to, you know, talk people into giving you money and casting and all of that stuff. You're still selling. Right. Yeah. As a person who's gone through that a bunch of times, do you compartmentalize them or maybe has this year taught you to lump them together or, or mm. how, how do you see the, those two sides of the coin or are they the same? Yeah. I always talk about this and I'm still learning every year. That's a gr- what you said is exactly right. And it comes down to how do I prioritize my time? 
because mm-hmm. if I prioritize my time doing work that is meaningful and artistically fulfilling to me and using my artistry, then I'll get to the other stuff later. You know what I mean? But it's like mm-hmm. building safety around the things that are meaningful and important to you. And whatever time period of the day that that is, like for me, it's the morning, for Tim, it's the morning. For other people, it might be the night, whatever. But just like just like padding and making that that space sacred, you know, and trying to trying to hold on to it. But also like for for me, like I said, I I had a pretty fucking crazy year and I also had to just grieve and just not Mm -hmm. work and just not write stuff for a while because, boy, I've been trying to write this series and I just don't know if now I can do it. I just don't think I can do it right now. You know what I mean? I spent months Mm -hmm. developing this like sci fi comedy but I've been like forcing myself to do it, which is good, I think, because I, I do believe you show up and then inspiration finds you at your desk from nine to 12. You know what I mean? Like that's where, where that's where she comes. But mm. at some point too, I'm like, also maybe I just can take a few weeks or a few months off from writing Definitely because can. it's yeah. just, it's just, um, I don't know. It's just, it, that's okay too. But it's hard. Yeah. Yeah, I like how you said that you were like grieving. You gave yourself time to grieve because yeah. usually the response is, I lost this. Let me hurry up right. and find something else or let me create something else as a coping mechanism or like to avoid. Yeah, that's that's really quite amazing that you did I that. I agree. Just sitting with it is so important. I mean, and, and I just think, yeah, I mean, and Matt, you were saying, it sounds like you were asking kind of this question of like, if one thing is art the, and the other one's not, how do I deal with that? You know, how mm-hmm. do I put on the cap and take it off or whatever? But I've come to think, I'm not sure it's such a good idea to take the cap off. And I think, you know, we have to be artists the whole time. Um, I know that's also the cool answer and you're, you can't really, you're not going to want to dispute that. Tim, I agree. I, but no, I think it's more, it's more that it's more the opposite actually that like I, apply my artistry to both but the art is still commercial is still commerce and that that is right yes but i I just i don't know that that works so well in my opinion with my work every time i kind of go like okay this is not my thing it's your thing i'll just push the buttons and do what you want me to do it's just crap. And it's just no, no, doesn't I, give me I, good work. I agree entirely. Like, why I, did I, what value is it, you know, for me? Anyway, this is my story. I'm not that, that version of it. No, like, Tim, Tim, I, I, I'm, I'm not articulating myself clearly. I agree 100% that hmm. that is right. I'm saying on the other side, where I'm like pouring my heart into, say, a feature and a fucking corporation hmm. is like, well, no, we're not going to make this anymore or something like that. How do you deal with that side of the coin? Right. Like if you bend a few things and make something not as good. Yeah. Or just, you know, I guess I'm, I'm just thinking about the nature of us investing so much of ourselves into this art and craft that is still innately commercial. How do you square that? And it sounds like the answer is for you, Tim, it's like, well, you just d- deal with the heartbreak because you're an artist the whole way through and that's going to make the work better. I mean, I think that makes the commerce better. So I don't know. It's a tough call. Yeah, Like you can't make something like this decision to leave or any of the Korean type cinema movies here in America because. Oh, I thought you, I thought you were meant just like leaving. Oh, all, no, no, all of you <laughs> should watch. Leave. That's yeah, why yeah. I, I, I yeah, should. Yeah. Now, now I get uh, Sorry. But, but you <laughs> know, it's like, it's like, yeah, I understand yeah. your question, yeah. Emma, because it's like, no matter what, because we're sort of tethered to, you know, the demand of it being a business and you <laughs> making a product, like whether it's a commercial or a feature. Um, but I don't know. It's like those auteurs, like unless they're Nolan or like, you know, Spielberg or like someone <laughs> who's able to really just lead with that clout mm-hmm. and have that kind of trust immediately. I think we all sort of have to lean into the beauty of not having that complete choice. Like True. I agree with Tim. It's like I could make a lifetime movie but I could still find so much joy in it because I fucking love my friends and it's so much fun being there, making it, 
and with all the parameters that they want of me, even though I would love to make something like The Handmaiden, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the question when people ask you, what is your favorite work that you've done? Like, and the answer is, it's always what's yet to come, right? I just think it's so important that we examine our mindset. My Toyota commercials from 2018. (laughs) (laughs) Great! Oh my god! You have a response. That's, That's when amazing. everyone's like, uh, "Oren, we want to pitch you for something. What should we put on your reel?" I'm like, "Well, my work that uh, is yet to come." I, I do think, though. I I think this is kind of all related because, and, I, and one of the things I've tried to do this year, and like you know, saying no to things is like, when there's a job where I cannot find the artistic merit, the thing that I I am excited about. In general, when I would turn it down, you know, and that's what I'm trying to do more. Like if mm-hmm. I get creative, you know, to pitch on commercials that I don't like, then I'll pitch something I do like, you know, and mm-hmm. maybe one out of four out of five times I will not get the job because they told me what the creative is and I'm changing it. Like this year I got I, I did that and I got probably like my best commercial gig ever, you know, in November, just pitching like how I wanted to do this thing, which was like very different from their script. So I, I think it's all like you can make your commercial or your music video, your, your episode of TV, like super artistically satisfying. Um, if you, you know, pitch it your way. And if, if they don't want to do it your way, then you say no. There's such power to that. Definitely. Yeah. But it's hard, but you have to, you have to be okay waiting the four months to get the job you want. And you have to, you know, maybe save up some some money <laughs> so that you're less anxious during that. Or time. I'll just show up at your houses for dinner and I'll be like, you got an extra plate? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anytime, Roxy. Anytime. Roxy, you were asking earlier, like, how, like, what do we do? How do we deal with this, this issue? And I had read this New York Times, like, best of article. And this woman was asking her friends for like the best advice they got. And she says, the best piece of advice I got this year came from a story a friend of mine told me about what she would say to herself when her three kids were very young and she felt overwhelmed as if there weren't enough hours in the day. She would say, you're doing great. Keep going. I found these simple words deeply inspiring at tough moments. You guys, I got this really weird feeling, a really beautiful feeling compared to how we sounded like four years ago. We all matured so much and we all sound so much more tired. (laughs) 